Hi everyone, I'm Stephanie Quayle. I'm a teaching and learning librarian at York University. And I'm Sarah Koish, the digital engagement librarian at York University. In this presentation, Inside Out, a curriculum for making grant outputs into OER, Stephanie and I will discuss how we developed and delivered an open educational resource training program for faculty who had received teaching and learning innovation funding from York University. Our presentation today is divided into four sections. I will begin by discussing York's Academic Innovation Fund grant program, open educational resources and adult learning theory as it applied to this project. Stephanie will then elaborate on the training program format and content, and I will then explain how the program changed due to COVID-19. And Stephanie will round out the presentation by outlining the program outcomes and next steps. In this first section of the presentation, I will cover York's Academic Innovation Fund grant program, open educational resources, and adult learning theory. York's Academic Innovation Fund was created in 2010 to encourage innovation in teaching, learning, and the student experience. The fund supports implementation of projects that advance York University's institutional priorities, including e-learning, experiential education, student success, and internationalization. The AIF program encourages innovation and change at York University by supporting new initiatives or those that extend current initiatives in significant new ways. One and a half million dollars are awarded annually, and this year there were 76 unique projects. From 2011 to 2020, more than 14 million in financial support was awarded to 312 unique projects. The university's associate vice president teaching and learning who manage the, manages the AIF program identified that there was a need to preserve the AIF project outputs in a communal repository. In the past, projects were to be preserved by each individual faculty. York Space, which is the open access institutional repository for York University, was identified as best suited to house the project outputs as it enables York community members to post, organize, disseminate, and preserve their scholarly outputs online in an institutional context. York Space, an instance of DSpace, hosts a variety of scholarly outputs, including faculty papers, award-winning student papers, electronic theses and dissertations, and conference proceedings. All materials deposited in York Space are made freely available on the open web without access restrictions. The decision to use York Space as a communal repository sparked an even greater discussion about licensing and open educational resources. And as a result, a task group was struck as an advisory body to develop an open educational and open licensing curriculum, to advise on a process for populating past AIF projects and other teaching initiatives into York Space, and to advise on a framework for embedding open access practices into AIF grant application and other teaching and learning initiatives. The group was comprised of the Associate Vice President Teaching and Learning, who was the chair, a teaching, and learning, a teaching Commons representative, a Copyright Office representative, two librarians, Stephanie and myself, several Associate Deans and faculty members who had an interest in open education. After some discussion, the group decided that not only would past projects be added to York Space, but that as a condition of this year's grants, that a Creative Commons license would be selected, bearing in mind that ownership remains with the course developer and that support and training on selecting an appropriate license would be provided. As well, a copy and or link to the project would be deposited into York Space, bearing in mind that support and training would be provided in making such a deposit. This changed the course of the task group as it was now necessary to create a pilot curriculum and a process to support the open license requirement for the 2020 iteration of the AIF program, as well as future teaching and learning initiatives. We'd like to take a moment here in our presentation to share a few questions to reflect upon. Please think about your learning preferences and how you would like to learn about open educational resources and Creative Commons licenses. Do you have examples of places where you go to find this information, such as websites, videos, blogs, listservs, or courses, etc.? Please, please feel free to go to our Google Doc and share your thoughts in part one of the document. In our design of the program, we strive to keep in mind our audience, which was adult learners. Using Knowles' theory of andragogy, which is based upon six main assumptions about adult learners, we designed self-paced modular content. We ensured that the modular content allowed the learner to pick and choose based on their pre-existing knowledge. 
we made the content clear and purposeful to show its value and application and ensured that its design was based on learning outcomes which were clearly stated at the beginning of each module. We provided additional content so that faculty could delve deeper if they were curious about a particular aspect or topic. And we also used our learning of objectives and agenda to show what they would learn and how it tied back to their project needs. With these adult learning theory principles in mind, we use these concepts when developing the training program's format and content, which I will now cover in this section of the presentation. Initially, we imagined that the training program would consist of four in-person workshops. The first module, OER 101, covered defining OER, examples of OER, and faculty and student benefits. The second module covered Canadian copyright basics. We also covered the six Creative Commons licenses, CC0, and creating effective CC license statements. The third module covered finding and evaluating OER. We focused on searching eCampus Ontario's Open Library and the OASIS Federated Search. We covered specific search strategies participants could use to find OER and highlighted OER evaluation frameworks. The fourth module covered Yorkspace deposits. This module taught participants about Yorkspace and how to prepare their submission and deposit. We also included content on accessibility considerations, such as making transcripts for video content and alt text for images. Finally, we intended to use Moodle to manage the in-person components of the training program and provide participants with optional homework components. Due to COVID-19, we switched our delivery method to an asynchronous program structure and a synchronous live Zoom structure. For both sections, we used a Moodle course shell. Here's what the Moodle shell looked like for the asynchronous section. The structure of this didn't deviate too much from what we wanted to create if we had been able to do an in-person version of the program. During the summer, participants enrolled in either the asynchronous or the synchronous program. Participants were given one week to complete each module. While there were four components in each module, not all components were required. We developed the program in this way based on the feedback we received from members of our AIF Open Education Working Group. They encouraged us to make the program so that individuals could put more or less work into it based on their challenging schedules. The first part of a module was a recommended warm-up exercise that would take no more than 10 minutes to complete. Typically, a warm-up activity would include a short video or reading, and faculty would then complete a three-question survey. It was meant to be completed before the live Zoom session or pre-recorded lecture to help the participants develop a base level of knowledge about the module's topic. The second part of the module was required. Depending on the section participants were in, they would use either they would attend either the live one hour Zoom session or watch a pre recorded lecture built using H5P. The third part of the module was a recommended building block activity. This activity would typically take participants 15 to 30 minutes to complete, and it was designed so that participants could apply their new knowledge and create deliverables that fed directly into the development of their AIF projects. For example, in the copyright and open licensing module, we asked participants to watch a video on combining different CC licensed materials and had them answer some questions such as which site CC license they'd like to use for their project and why. Finally, the additional resources section consisted of links to readings, videos, and help resources. We also used three types of forums to create participant engagement in the course. The course announcements forum was used to provide program announcements and reminders. Each module had their own building block forum. Participants were encouraged to post their completed building block activity to the respective forums so that they could receive feedback from Sarah and myself. Finally, we set up a general discussion forum for each Moodle course where participants were encouraged to post questions and updates. When we first began compiling the content for the training program, we created a long list of resources to use, but in the end, we found that we relied heavily on the openly licensed content listed on this slide. For example, the State University of New York's OER Services Unit had created a set of courses on OER. We were able to repurpose some of this content. We also drew heavily on resources developed by Abby Elder, and we repurposed activity activities from Abby and Stacy's OER Starter Kit workbook. 
Additionally, we used content from Spark's Open Education Leadership Program for librarians, and we incorporated content from your Q librarians. For example, we reused content from my OER guide and OER presentations, and a copyright FAQ developed by York librarians John Dupuy and Chris Joseph. Overall, it's important to note that there is a lot of excellent content out there already if you're asked to develop a similar program, and since the content tends to be openly licensed, you'll be able to repurpose it for your institutional context. Stephanie just described the format and structure. Now I'm going to discuss how we shifted our plans due to the COVID-19 campus closure. As we were no longer able to offer the in-person workshops, we decided to offer two options for faculty a synchronous and an asynchronous version of the program. In each fa version, faculty enrolled in a Moodle course. In the synchronous version, they attended live one-hour Zoom sessions once a week for four weeks. And in the asynchronous version, they completed pre-recorded lectures, which we released weekly over four weeks. Both versions had the same recommended warm-up and building block activities. In order to facilitate discussion and active learning, we used Zoom polls and breakout rooms in our live synchronous sessions. We recorded these Zoom sessions with the permission of our participants so that we could post them later for those who might not have been able to attend. During the live Zoom sessions, participants were encouraged to use this chat feature to ask questions or to unmute and post questions throughout the presentation. At times, we had to take those questions offline or address them at the end of the Zoom session in order to keep within our one hour timeline. All of the content within the program was licensed with a Creative Commons license in order for us to model open educational practices and also to allow project leads to share the content with others working on their projects. Co-teaching was important for this program as one instructor would lead the Zoom session while the other instructor would monitor the, the chat. This allowed us to answer chat questions in great detail and to answer a great number of questions. For example, during our copyright and open licensing live Zoom session, we had over 40 questions. Co-teaching also allowed us to divide up providing feedback in Moodle via the forums. This was especially valuable for the asynchronous version of the program as participants posted more frequently. Working together also afforded us the ability to share in the content and program creation which was important as there was a lot of content that needed to be created in a short amount of time, especially for the asynchronous version of the course as we created H5P presentations with embedded videos. For the asynchronous pre-recorded lectures, we originally thought that we could just use the recorded Zoom sessions for, from the synchronous version of the course. Upon reflection, we felt that we needed a more succinct version of the content, but with built-in interactive components. For that reason, we chose H5P. H5P is an open source program. It integrates into learning management systems such as Moodle and Canvas. It produces interactive HTML content with over 30 different content types to choose from. We used eCampus and Ontario's H5P Studio to create our content as we had free accounts and it was more stable than the H5P website. eCampus Ontario's H5P Studio is also archives the content in the library for other Ontario post-secondary educators to reuse. Before starting with, we checked H5P's accessibility features for the different content types and chose the course presentation and interactive videos as they were both accessible. We then set to work writing scripts and recording mini lectures and screencasts via Zoom. We broke up each mod module into parts and recorded each part separately. For example, for module one, OER 101, we had part one, what is OER? Part two, OER examples, and part three, OER benefits. We then edited these videos using iMovie and uploaded them to YouTube to add the closed captioning. The overall shell was an H5P course presentation as it allowed us to add multiple choice questions, fill in the blanks, text, and other types of interactions to the presentation in between the videos. The individual parts that we recorded be turned into interactive videos as it allowed us to add multiple choice, fill in the blank, pop-up text, and hyperlinks and other types of interactions. We then embedded these interactive videos into the H5P course presentation. And now we're going to show you the module one OER 101 H5P presentation. So here's the introduction slide. And we have embedded in here a little welcome video from Stephanie and I. And then you'll see some of the um, interactive content within the presentation. So here um, participants could select their OER knowledge and check. And then on the next slide, 
we'll see the first video. This is an interactive um, video and we'll press play and listen just to the intro and we'll see, you'll see, be able to see the interactive comp components. Before we look more closely at how to define an OER, let's do a quick activity to see how familiar you are with the concept. And here participants would complete a, a quick quiz um, and defining what open educational resources are and they can check their knowledge. So as you can see, the H5P course presentations uh, were created, and then we took those presentations and embedded them in the Moodle program and released them weekly. Now that Sarah has covered how we used various technology to adjust to the COVID-19 campus closure, I'll now cover the program outcomes in our next steps. I just wanted to start this section by sharing some excellent feedback we received from Professor Luke Arneson, one of the participants in the asynchronous program. I confess that when it began, given how busy the summer has been and how preoccupied we've all been with preparing for the fall, I was sort of dreading it and wondering how I would find the time. But from the first module, I was blown away by how helpful, concrete, and brimming with resources it was. And I have come out of the experience thinking that access to this course may well be the greatest benefit of getting the grant and doing the project. Sarah and I were so happy to receive this feedback from Luke. We felt that this feedback really captured some of the excellent experiences faculty had in the program. Let's take a closer look at some specific program outcomes. For the synchronous section, we had 27 participants. Only one out of the 27 participants never accessed the Moodle site, and we typically had 24 students in our live Zoom sessions. We felt like these were good numbers considering the faculty participants didn't realize they would be asked to take such a long program in the middle of the summer when they signed their AIF contracts. For the asynchronous section, only five out of 54 participants never accessed the Moodle site. Sarah and I were worried about participant engagement in the asynchronous section. However, we relied heavily on the forums to create a greater sense of engagement. Whenever a participant would post anything on a forum, we would respond within one to two business days and provide them with detailed feedback and resources. However, active asynchronous participants had varying levels of activity, which ranged from strong interaction, meaning a participant completed the recommended activities and the pre-recorded lecture, but we also had participants with low interaction who only completed the pre-recorded module. After completing each module, we asked faculty to fill out an evaluation form, which consisted of closed-ended and open-ended questions. Here's an example of some feedback we gathered from module one. Overall, we found the evaluation forms were a useful way of tracking how participants were understanding the material. Also, the open-ended questions helped us identify areas where we could improve the content and delivery method. We also experienced some unexpected program outcomes. For example, some of the faculty really enjoyed the way we structured the training programs. The faculty that attended our live Zoom sessions enjoyed our active learning components and we received comments about how they wanted to use a similar, similar approach in their fall courses. Some of the asynchronous participants were also very interested in our use of H5P and are now building H5P interactives into their AIF projects. Finally, faculty started asking really great great questions about the software they were planning to use for their projects. For example, they wanted to know if they could still make an OER if they ended up using proprietary software. All of this indicated to me and Sarah that faculty were starting to examine their past practices and consider how they could embed openness throughout their projects. In terms of next steps, we expect that we'll start depositing Category 4 AIF projects into YorkSpace in December 2020. We then anticipate Category 1, 2, and 3 projects will be deposited into YorkSpace between May to July 2021. We'll also be working with eCampus Ontario to have our AIF OER projects cross-listed in eCampus's open library. In terms of potential future steps, we're still analyzing the participant feedback about the program. We'll use this feedback to improve the content and we'll likely run both sections again next May. We're also discussing how we could roll out and expand the program to faculty and grad students with no AIF funding with our campus's open education working group. Finally, we'd like to create additional modules that discuss topics like open pedagogy, inclusivity and accessibility in more depth. 
Now it's time for our second reflection question. We recognize that it can be difficult to measure the success of training programs for faculty. We'd like you to think about what types of ideas you have to better evaluate this kind of program or any kind of training program for faculty. Or if you have run a faculty training program in the past, how did you evaluate it? Please feel free to go to our Google Doc and share your thoughts in part two of the doc. If you have any questions about the training program, please feel free to contact Sarah or myself. Also, we've provided a link to a digital takeaway with our course content in case you would like to reuse it for your institution.